still early on in the NBA offseason, what are you least worried about or concerned about with the Sacramento Kings at this point in time? On today's podcast, part one of my conversation with my partner Kevin John from ABC10, we'll discuss what we're least concerned about right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all offseason long. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter at ABC 10 News, where I work every single day with my guest on today's podcast. Not the first time that Kevin John has joined me here on Locked On Kings. Certainly won't be the last. Kevin and I work together uh, as the entire sports department at ABC 10. We travel together covering the Sacramento Kings. Always one of us, if not both of us, are at every single Kings home game. He and I were in New Orleans for the play-in game. We have gone together through these two roller coaster seasons for Sacramento. We've had a lot of fun working together, uh, and it's always fun to have him on the podcast. So this is part one of our conversation where, at first, Kevin's going to kind of give you his feel for what this offseason is going to be, if it's going to be a kind of a loud, busy, chaotic, and active offseason like we're hoping and expecting, or if he has a feeling that it's going to be maybe a little more quiet and a little more disappointing than what we're expecting. We'll discuss that. Then we'll get into what we are least concerned about with the Sacramento Kings at this point in time. Now, this is a very broad topic or very broad umbrella of conversation, right? And we want for you to be a part of that conversation as well. Again, it could be anything involving the Sacramento Kings. It could be player-specific, could be team-specific, could be off-season-specific, draft-specific. Whatever route you want to go, it's what you think and right now you feel is the least concerning part or the thing that you personally are the least worried about with the Sacramento Kings right now. If you want to share your answer, please do so. If you're watching on YouTube, get loose in the comment section down below. If you want to reach me on Twitter or X, you can at MattGeorgeSack, and you can email me, MattGeorgeSports, at gmail.com. What are you least concerned about with the Sacramento Kings right now at this early point in the offseason. Kevin and I answer right here on Locked on Kings. Welcome into the ABC 10 sports office. We're bringing Locked on Kings into the ABC 10 world with my partner in crime, Kevin John. Kevin and I have done a number of podcasts together. Kevin, one of my favorite podcasts that we did a a little over a year ago was when in between games two and three, right, we're in the car driving down to the Bay Area, driving down to the Trace Center. The Kings had a 2-0 lead in the series against the Warriors at the time. We don't need to talk about how that series ended up, but that was, uh, I think, one of the first times that we did a podcast together. Now we're kind of in the early stages of of the off season, right? It's it's like the calm before the storm it feels like. Before we dive into what I really want to focus on today, which is things that we are and aren't concerned about about the state of the Sacramento Kings right now. Just your kind of gut feeling, feeling of like we're almost in June, which is draft month, then we get into summer league, sooner or later we'll get into free agency and stuff like that. Just do you feel like this is going to be a summer worth all the hype that has a lot of moves and a lot of things that's going to keep the both of us busy? Or do you think this kind of feels like it's going to be one of those summers where we expect a lot and it's ultimately a letdown? Well, first of all, Matt, let's go back a year ago to last summer. I don't want to. Uh, well, the, yeah, the, the reason I say that, not in a bad way. By the way, it's funny. The podcast we were talking about last summer, we were driving up to San Francisco. Kings were up 2-0. We were feeling optimistic. And then they lost the subsequent two games. And we know how that series ended up, Matt. So They lost game three without Draymond because they're better without Draymond, by the way. Ah, well, with that being said... Uh, <laughs> You know, when you look when you look ahead and you look at this summer, the reason I wanted to compare last summer to this summer is because remember last summer, even though they had lost that series to Golden State, they went seven games with them. There was a high level of optimism for sure, and you saw it with the team. You felt it with the city, with the franchise overall. You felt they were going into last off season. Wow, it's we're only going to go up from here. Sure. There's a lot to build on from here. For sure, it was one of the first off seasons, Matt's, in what 15 years where I think Sacramento. 
Kings fans truly felt optimistic with the direction of the franchise, where they were headed. We had two All-NBA players last year, granted third team, and De'Aaron Fox, Demonis Sabonis, and the, the trajectory was high. Mike Brown had just won Coach of the Year. Monty McNair run Executive of the Year. So, Matt, going back to last year at the same exact time, I believe the optimism was through the roof of the Sacramento Kings, and you were right. like, this is a team a year from now who's going to make a late run into the playoffs and is on the right track. We were hoping. Now fast forward to this season and this year and where we're at, and dear God, it's it's safe to say I almost felt like the Kings took a step back from where they were last year. I mean, at this, and numbers will say they did. Yeah, I was about to I mean, if you just want to look at the games won, they won 48 games last year, third seed. They won 46 games this year, ninth seed. And um, we, we, they missed the playoffs altogether. So before I kind of talk about, you know, the offseason, just when you think about from last year to this year, it's just a, a drastically different, drastic changes. This The way this season ended, Matt, could not have been more disappointing. Mm. You're literally in the sixth seed with, what, two to three weeks left in the regular season. Mm. You lose some games you really could have won, and then you find yourself in a play-in game or, or, or play-in tournament. Now, the silver lining, Matt, they got to end the Warriors' season this year and potentially the Warriors' dynasty. That's not a bad this consolation is, prize. Exactly. So I was <laughs> going to say, for what it's worth, even though they didn't make the playoffs, the fact that they ended the team season who ended their season last year is somewhat of revenge. But all right, now to get now, now to kind of break down what you were talking about. When you look at this offseason right now, Matt, I honestly think it's not going to be a quiet, relaxing offseason. And the reason I say that, Matt, is if you look at what happened during the trade deadline back in February, mm-hmm. it was relatively quiet. Monty McNair did not pull the, the trigger on a lot of things. There was talk about Pascal Siakam, but I guess Pascal would not have signed Correct. to stay here or an extension here in Sacramento. Right. So, needless to say, it was relatively quiet. Mm-hmm. The reason I don't think this is going to be a quote-unquote quiet offseason is because you're looking at what's going on in the West right now. You're looking at teams like the Dallas Mavericks, the OKC Thunder, um, and, you know, Denver, of course, is going to be Denver. Minnesota, who's young and getting... So you just look at all of the teams out in the West, and you look at the Sacramento Kings right now, and you're thinking, okay, what do we have to do in order to make ourselves competitors? What do we have to do to make sure that we raise the bar? And Matt, if there's one nice thing I did see, defensively, the Kings were better this yeah. year than last year. Big and, time. And that was one of the things that I felt last year they were able to hide behind their horrific defense because their offense was historically great. But um, clearly, when you look at playoff basketball, and I'm pointing to our TV in the office, if they're like, what is he pointing at? <laughs> um, when you think about playoff basketball, you're not seeing 140 points scored tonight, 130 points uh, scored. A lot of these scores are under 100 points yep. if you look at it. So um, anyway, getting back to the offseason, I don't think it's going to be a, a, a calm one because I believe that Monty McNair, um, you know, Mike Brown, all of them right now are looking at what's going on. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with Malik Monk, and I'm mm-hmm. sure we'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. But I don't really see them just kind of sitting back and saying, okay, you know, not much we can do. I honestly think that really if there's any silver lining to the way this season ended, maybe it lit a fire underneath mm-hmm. uh, Monty McNair or the, you know, the Kings front office, executive office to do something. Now, another thing I would make this offseason interesting is what the Kings end up deciding to do with the 13th pick. Yeah. You know, are they going to be busy at the combine looking at players? Or are they going to trade it away? Yeah. I mean, that's something else that's going to kind of dictate how we move with this offseason. But, Matt, I, I just don't see it being a kind of slow kick the feet up and just say, let's just let things play out. I, I think there's things going on behind the scenes. Yeah, I think a lot of Kings fans ultimately would be upset by a quiet offseason. They certainly don't want to see the Kings run it back, even if that meant re-signing Malik Monk. It's a big move, but if that's the only move you do, I think you're you're, you're not feeling too great. Although, there have been some comments, there were some comments by Mike Brown at his end-of-season press conference that suggest that maybe the Kings feel like if they were to go that route again, they're they're the 46 wins and where they finish in the West this year is not accurate to where he feels like they can be and where they were going. A lot of that has to do with playing and playing defense for 82 games instead of just the final third of the season, which is stuff we'll get into. But a big difference to me between last off season and this off season, in addition to the optimism, which you brought up is last season was kind of uncharted territory, <laughs> at least from our perspective, right? Oh, yeah. They're going into a summer where the Kings are coming off of a playoff appearance and there's optimism. And I'm the kind of person I think you are as well, where we hold ourselves. And I think a lot of people will naturally hold themselves to a linear progression. And what I mean by that is, 
you constantly want to be just trending upward. Even if it's small, but you want to continuously be going in the right direction, right? I'm the kind of person to where if I if I stalemate or I even I take a step back, it's incredibly frustrating to me. And Mike, I think, has spoken directly to me at times this season in media press conferences, basically saying, Matt, like, progression isn't always this way. Yeah. So yeah, and he's someone who's been there before and and gone through it before. So that's oh, yeah. what I think a big off a difference between last off season and this off season is. Last off season was kind of uncharted territory for all of us, except for Mike telling us, "Hey, it's hard as hell to get from good to great." Yes, and now we're getting yes. it. Now we've gone through a season of, "Oh God, that was hard as hell to get from good to great," like the rest of the Western Conference. And here the Kings are now trying to figure that out. So Mike just continues to be proven right time and time mm-hmm. and time again by the things that he says, which is why I feel like. I mean, one of the things that should get done without question this offseason is an extension for Mike Brown. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, And more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time. More, you get your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. I wanted to jump into this and we're going to focus a lot on this for the podcast today. We're each going to share one thing that we are not concerned about with the Kings, and then we'll share one thing that we are concerned about with the Kings. And it could be anything off-season related, based off of last season, future projected. And this is something we want to hear from you as well. So in the comment section on YouTube, share one thing that you're concerned about, one thing you're not concerned about. You can send that to me on Twitter or on X, at MattGeorgeSack. You can email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Kev, We'll each share one. Why don't we start with you? What's one thing that you're not concerned about with the Sacramento Kings, at least on this day at this point in time? One thing I would say I'm not concerned about is the role of the players and what the players on this roster know what they're supposed to do and contribute. Let me explain what I mean by that, because I'm sure that's kind of vague. Well, when you look a year ago, Matt, Kind of coming into the uh, kind of kind of coming into the season, or excuse me, two years ago, coming into the 0203 season. It wasn't, when I say that we were kind of unsure what the rows were, who was the bona fide leader of the team? Who was the spirit animal of the team? <laughs> who was the, you know, who was the cheerleader of the team? Who was the defensive specialist of the team? Sure. Who, there was a lot of these roles that we just did not know who was going to assume what role, who was going to step up and be this role, who was going to be the emotional leader, who was going to be a lot of those things. And I think that we've kind of seen throughout this season players kind of stepping up into the roles that I feel they're supposed to be. De'Aaron Fox is someone who Mike Brown has challenged in the past to be more vocal and to be a leader and to kind of take, you know, um, um, initiative on certain things. And we've seen Fox kind of dive into that role, particularly this year. Granted, he wasn't an all-star, but still, we've seen him take a step up and be more vocal with some of the younger guys and kind of trying to help out um, and doing, you know, some of the coaching behind the scenes Hmm. and whatnot. Even at practices, when you see shoot-arounds and whatnot, and you look at what De'Aaron is doing and what he means to these players. Another person I uh, I want to talk about who was obviously an all-star last year in All-NBA players, Demonis Sabonis. We saw him go on this historic double-double streak this year. Um, triple doubles as well. He led the league in that. And, you know, there was a lot of questions surrounding Demonis Sabonis Mm -hmm. coming out of last season, especially in that postseason series against the Golden State Warriors where, by lack of uh, uh, better words, Kavon Looney kind of owned him, um, particularly on the glass. And I think that you kind of seen Demonis Sabonis this year kind of show you that he's not afraid to be gritty. He's not afraid to kind of do the dirty work, but still obviously be the facilitator that he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at big men who facilitate, I mean, you have Nikola Jokic, Demonis Sabonis. Those are only two ones that kind of come off the top of my head. And you've seen Demonis be more of a facilitator on offense. And part of the reason, I think, uh, we saw De'Aaron Fox's um, three-point, you know, percentage kind of, I go up 
farther this year, and his three-point attempts kind of increased this year, and I think that's as a result of just the spacing on the floor. The only person I'll say, Matt, who I don't think they know their role yet and I want to see them come into it is Keegan Murray. That was someone who was, I was expecting to take a dramatic leap this year. And yeah, he had that 47 point freaking outing against Utah. I think it was, I can't remember. Um, uh, where he was ridiculous. So we've seen glimpse of greatness, but if there is something else who's uh, speaking of roles and players kind of coming into their roles, which is what I'm talking about. Um, I would love to see Keegan Murray, uh, a step into the role that he, which is he could be a third, uh, the third option on that team. Mm -hmm. um, but, and also it's, with speaking of roles, I mean, I think Malik Monk, who we'll talk about later, he embraced his role as the six man and running the second unit. Um, obviously he wants to start eventually, and that's for another day. But I believe that he really embraced that. Also other players who embraced their roles. I think Davion Mitchell did a great job of embracing his role. Um, he wasn't in the rotation earlier in the year. We saw that change uh, come, what, the second half of the season where he really embraced his, you know, just becoming a, a, a great defender and knocking down three-point shots. Also somebody else toward the end of the season who I believe was one of the best stories was Keon Ellis, yeah. a two-way player. He came in and embraced, he became a star. Carter, obviously after Kevin Herter went down, but he embraced that role sure. of who he needed to be, which was a lockdown defender, and he even did give you some offensive outputs at times. So Matt, what I, going back to what I, I, I would say, one of the things that I liked, and I think that I would not say there's a cause for worry, is just players embracing the roles that they have, and you've seen them take leaps in their respective roles uh, this season. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is also brought to you by BetterHelp. This is a fitting sponsor for a podcast episode when I'm with my partner, Kevin John. Kevin has, and I, I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing this, Kevin has been through it in terms of mental health and being tested and dealing with severe depression and things like that. And he and I are both tremendous supporters of therapy and of seeking the mental health that everybody needs to take care of themselves the same way that you keep active physically or need to take care of your body for your own health that way mental health should be taken just as seriously if times even more seriously to be honest with you now therapy sometimes kind of has a, a taboo feel about it it's getting more and more common more and more comfortable but you might be on the fence about it I encourage you just give it a try. Your issues, whether big or small, deserve to be talked about, deserve to be worked out, and you will be a better person. Your life will feel easier, feel more equipped to tackle the challenges that daily life throws at you by seeing a therapist and prioritizing your mental health. And if you're considering giving therapy a try, go to BetterHelp. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with the licensed therapists that you need and and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. You set me up perfectly for what I'm not concerned about because you talked about Keegan Murray, and I'm, I'm not concerned about Keegan Murray at this point at oh. all because he made a tremendous jump defensively which is something we didn't see coming right we were hoping for and we saw the next step of the offense coming so much so that at the beginning of the year Monty McNair did an interview with the athletic and in his interview with the athletic he said like hey we, we need a big leap we're expecting a big leap offensively mm -hmm. from Keegan Murray so everybody was kind of expecting this is the next step of Keegan's progression mm -hmm. and Keegan just goes uh wrong the next step in my progression is going from a guy that had defensive potential to a, one of the best defenders on the team immediately. He's the best defender at his position. He's the best wing defender on this Kings roster. Mm -hmm. Now, it's debatable if he's the best defender, period. I think Davion Mitchell, Keon Ellis, and even De'Aaron Fox are in that conversation. De'Aaron Fox led the NBA in, in steals, steals, yeah. steals, for God's sake. So, But I'm not concerned with the progression of Keegan Murray because we have to remember, and, it, and it's and it's kind of hard to feel this way sometimes because we think about the Kings' timeline and they're trying to win right now and you have Fox and Sabonis who are in their prime and in their upper 20s and Harrison Barnes is now in his 30s and blah, blah, blah. Keegan Murray's entering his third year in the league, right? And he's he has shown this growth over the... He went from his, his essentially freshman rookie year 
of being a three-point catch-and-shoot specialist who Mike Brown was challenging him to try and put the ball on the ground more and attack the rim more aggressively to this past season. He kind of got a little bit away from that three-point shot. He wasn't as much of a three-point catch-and-shoot specialist. You could tell he was trying to create for himself more, but he attacked the rim a lot more aggressively this time. One of the concerns I think I have, if at all, with Keegan and the Kings, I think think it's a mutual issue, is the games where Keegan starts off hot and then the Kings, for some reason, completely go, go away, away from, from him. him. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a Keegan issue of he needs to develop and grow more as a guy that says, I'm hot, get me the ball. Mm-hmm. Or if the Kings need to recognize he's the hot hand and and say, okay, we're going to go away from Fox. We're going to go away from Monk. We're going to go away from Sabonis and keep Keegan cooking. And they did that in the night that he scored 45 points. So... I'm not concerned at all about the progression of Keegan Murray because he's just going into year three. He's shown steady growth. He's embraced everything that Mike Brown publicly and privately has asked of him. Um, And I, I have no concern. Like, look, there's a reason to me why. In every single trade conversation the Kings are having to try and include, uh, upgrade their roster, Keegan Murray is the first name being asked about. It's because he is a coveted player at a coveted position, and he has coveted measurements, the size, the athleticism, the length. He is what every team wants more of, and the Kings have him just going into year three, and he's already this good. He's, he's darn good. I mean, I would like Keegan to show a little more emotion sometime on the court or being a little bit more vocal. I he's cussed out Mike Brown a couple times. That is true. That is true. And, and it's always funny when you get that emotion out of Keegan because this is a guy who literally, he could be going through the worst day of his life or the best day of his life, and you would have no idea. <laughs> no clue. But with that being said, Matt, you know, one of the things when I was talking about Keegan's progression and saying that I did not necessarily see him take the leap that I would have liked to see him t- take this year— you're absolutely right. You called me on it. it. was offensively. And I think because of what he did last year, he broke the record uh, in his rookie year, mm-hmm. uh, beating past, surpassing Donovan Mitchell for the first threes in a season. And then, Matt, I got spoiled because I had a chance to see Keegan Murray in during the Cali league. Classic, yeah. where it was his second year, um, the Cali Classic this past, where he was just— he Dropped 50. He, I mean, 40 points one night. It was just so easy. Easy for Keegan. Right. It was so. Now, granted, it's the Cali Classic. But that's what so, you're supposed to do dude, if you're that good. That's what you're supposed to do is show it there, right? Exactly. And that's what and that's what he did. So I was expecting, you know, I was expecting at least, you know, um, I think it was the fourth leading scorer this year on the Kings, if I'm not mistaken, um, as far as points per game. Yes, I be, you're uh, right. Behind Fox, Sabonis, Malik, um, yeah, and I think him. he was right above Kevin Herter. But well, he was at, far above Kevin. I think he was at 15 and Kevin was down at 12. 12 but he, he and Kevin flip-flopped this year, so he was at 15 this year. That's right, but, you know, back to your thing about the defense, Matt. One of the things I want to say, and Matt really t- uh, uh, kind of hit, uh, hit in on this, was defensively. I remember this was... Earlier in the season last year, we were at Chase Center Mm -hmm. for a game. And as we all know, Steph Curry has been a Kings killer. I don't need to remind you of Game 7 last year in the first round of the playoffs. But I remember the second half, Mike put Keegan on Steph Curry. And Keegan did a phenomenal job. I can't remember off the top of my head Steph's stats in the second half, but I just remember once Keegan went on Steph Curry, it was completely different. Yeah. And he made Steph work for it. And I think that's one of Keegan's more under, well, I shouldn't say underrated, but I think because Keegan is such a great shooter and offensively we know he can go off, people don't talk about how great a defender he is. Because I don't think people expected it coming into the league. They thought, yeah. okay, he has, the, he has the tools to be a good defender, but in year two he showed he not only is he a good defender, you can put him on the best dude on the other team and he'll be successful. Absolutely. And, you, you know, you, you, you lock that up. And, you, you know, obviously you look at the fact that he is being asked to do things defensively. I do believe, yes, we will still get – Keegan could still be a 20 20- – points per game kind of person by year five, six, what if he wants to be. They might need him to be. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, depending on what happens. he. But to be able to get that kind of um, production on both sides of the ball from somebody is phenomenal, which is why, why you said his name is at the top of trade. Um, other teams who are looking for him as part of a trade package. Mm. Thank you to Kevin for joining me here on this Locked On Kings podcast. But again, this was just part one of our conversation. On tomorrow's episode, we get a little more doom and gloom. The things, the two things, one from each of us, that we are most concerned about with the Sacramento Kings at this point in time. We'll discuss at length on tomorrow's episode of Locked on Kings, so I hope you will join me for that. If you want to answer your mo- what you're most uh, concerned about, save it for tomorrow's episode. Save it. 
On this episode, just share what you're least concerned about or least worried about at this point in time. My pessimists out there will get to you in the next episode. I promise we'll hear your thoughts and air those all out too because I know a lot of you have plenty of concerns with the Kings right now. So we'll get to that. I hope you will tune in for that episode. But for now, we are done. Until next time, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to Locked on Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.